Good afternoon, everyone. We're all aware of the public health status, uh, or excuse me, we're all aware of the status of the public health crisis facing our city. COVID-19 is spreading very rapidly. Hospitals are under stress and nearing capacity. Residents are lining up for tests, which are being conducted by the thousands every single day. And now we have the 4th of July weekend ahead of us. Please take a look at the graph on the monitors right now. We'll make that available for you as well. The current surge in the cases began almost exactly 14 days after the Memorial Day weekend. On Memorial Day in San Antonio, 79 COVID patients were in Bear County hospitals. As we enter into another holiday weekend, now more than 1,000 COVID patients are hospitalized in our community. We cannot withstand a similar surge two weeks after the 4th of July. So this Independence Day, we are depending on you to help stop the spread of this deadly virus. How? Here are four things to keep in mind during 4th of July. Number one, keep it within your own household. Do not attend large gatherings. Celebrate at home only with those who live in your home. We've closed city parks, we've closed county parks. Fireworks celebrations are canceled, so stay at home when you can. Wear masks when you can't. Wear masks, wash hands, stay six feet away from others. Simple thing to keep in mind, just stay home. Our community's lives depend on it. Now, celebrations outdoors are certainly um, should be done in your own backyard. Ventilation is better there and there's more space. Uh, but we want to, again, remind you to keep it within your household. Don't share food, drinks, and utensils. This is not the year to have a big spread of food or, a, or food for a whole group to share. This is a recipe for infection. Now, there will be many more fourths of July if we work together to keep our friends and family safe. No matter what any order says, the reality of this infection and this disease are clear. We must stay home to protect each other. We must exhibit the best practices that the public health professionals have told us from day one. I can't stress enough how critically important this is. The most patriotic thing you can do this Independence Day is to heed the warnings and stay away from parties, away from cookouts, and certainly away from large celebrations. We are depending on you. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Well, thanks, for Mayor, and thanks for uh, uh, making sure everybody understands what we're faced with this uh, coming weekend. As you know, back in, on the Easter holidays, we did close the uh, parks, and we're doing that now for July 4th. We'll be closed on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, through this holiday season. Now, we know this is Independent Day. We know people like to set off fireworks, but uh, please do them in a small unit of family members. Uh, wherever you can safely set off the fireworks. Uh, we know that there's two big uh, events happening uh, this weekend. Uh, we know that uh, Fiesta Texas will be uh, have opening, and so will uh, SeaWorld. So the measure that we put in place just yesterday uh, requiring temperature tests before entering facilities like this, I'm pleased to report to you that I talked to Jerry Siebert, who's the president of uh, Fiesta, Texas, and they will be screening before they come in. We will measure the temperature through the T ducts for the most accurate reading, no entry permitted when fever is detected. Rather than having 50%, uh, they've agreed to turn it down to 25% and monitor the social differences. So I do want to thank them for that effort. Uh, Chuck Carew from uh, SeaWorld has stated they're gonna limit opening, limit uh, uh, capacity to 30 percent and that they're also going to do temperature tests. So those are two events that could be um, pretty scary for us. Uh, as the mayor said, uh, it's the best to stay home, uh, enjoy your family, and uh, take care of this weekend. But if you're going to go to it, at least the um, uh, companies are taking extra measures to make sure that they're safe within there. Uh, we want to get through this July 4th. Uh, we don't want another spike on top of the spike we're getting already. 
and it's not slowing down. You will hear uh, in just a few minutes from the CEOs of our major hospital systems the challenges that they're facing. So as the mayor said, stay home if you can, take care of yourself, make sure you're just with small family unit, and let's get through this weekend with a lot, without a lot more serious cases facing us. Good afternoon, everybody. So I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you a true story. It's about a family, and let's call them the Martinez family. Mrs. Martinez, her husband, and two teenage children joined their extended family at her mother's house for a combined birthday party. A lot of people had birthdays during the shutdown, and they wanted to all gather together now that things were open again. There were about 25 people there. Everybody seemed healthy. Uh, Tia Maria had a little bit of allergies acting up, but other than that, everything was great. As families will do, there were hugs, there were kisses, there were shared tastes of delicious desserts, and a big potluck spread across multiple tables throughout the house. It was a rainy day, so everybody was crowded together into two rooms in the front of the house. It was wonderful to be back with family after having been isolated for so long. The next day, however, Tia Maria started feeling pretty sick. So she got a COVID-19 test and it turned out she was positive for COVID-19. The next week, five more people at that party got sick with COVID-19. Two of them, Mrs. Martinez and her son, Manuel, quickly developed breathing problems so severe that they were rushed to the hospital and both were placed on ventilators, side by side, in the same room. Manuel eventually recovered, but Mrs. Martinez, who had high blood pressure and diabetes, was not able to fight off the virus and died one week after her birthday. We hear this story a lot. Family is not a protection from the virus. If you don't live with a person, you should assume they could be carrying this virus keep your distance and save your hugs and kisses. We will get through this, but we need your help to make sure another child never has to share a hospital room with his mother and watch her die from this deadly virus. Please don't gather with people you don't live with this Independence Day. Your family is depending on you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Stone. I'm the CEO for the Baptist Health System. I'm here today to tell you about a very dire situation we're all facing. Our San Antonio area hospitals currently have 1,100 COVID-19 positive patients in their care. Roughly one third of those, or 350 of them, are needing ICU care. Over the past five weeks, our COVID-19 positive patients have doubled every seven to 10 days. And we see no signs of that stopping. We project that within two weeks, approximately 3,200 people in the Bear County area could potentially be hospitalized with COVID-19. And if those ICU percentages hold true, we're gonna need approximately 1,000 ICU beds. That's quite a bit more than what we currently have. What's really frightening is that there's very little we can do because many of those patients are already infected. The uh, masking order put in place a week and a half ago by the judge and the mayor that's helpful, that's fantastic, and hopefully we'll see those results in the next week or so. But if we want the turning point to come in two weeks, if we want things to begin to get better, there are some things we can do, but we have to do them today. Stay at home if you can, and I'm sorry if it sounds like a broken record, but it's important, stay at home. No more than 10 people per gathering, and if you do go to a gathering, which you shouldn't, stay six feet apart, okay? And please, please, please wear a mask. You know, many people still need a reason uh, for the mask. Um, and if you need another one, I can tell you, do it for the thousands of nurses that we have within our hospitals. Do it for the physicians that are taking care of your patients. Do it for my housekeepers, our dietary workers, okay? We need them. Keep us safe so we can keep you safe. 
And lastly, I want to say thank you for your support, your donations, your kind words, uh, gift cards, and of course the food that have been provided for many of the hospitals is much appreciated. And so in closing, I'll just say be safe and God bless. Good afternoon, my name is Alan Harrison. I'm the President and CEO of the Methodist Healthcare System. Exactly two weeks ago, uh, we had 75 positive COVID inpatients in the Methodist System. Today, we have 343. We can't sustain that type of growth of COVID positive inpatients in our community. We have more than quadrupled in exactly two weeks. That's unsustainable. Some people may tell you that it's just like the flu, except it's 50 times more likely to kill you than the flu is. 50 times the death rate of the flu. Quick personal uh, reflection, my dad died when I was in college. Uh, he never saw me graduate. He didn't see me get married. He didn't meet any of my kids. San Antonio is a family-centric city. There are a lot of people, a lot of people who regard their, the members of their family as precious to them, irreplaceable. Why would you gamble? Why would you gamble those relationships with your family in the midst of a pandemic right now? We would ask you on behalf of the hospital systems which are seeing unsustainable growth rates, please be safe. But I think your families would ask you to do the same thing. Thank you. My name is George Hernandez. I'm the CEO of University Health System. You know, we are uh, social creatures. Human beings are social creatures. And because we are social creatures, we have created the cities uh, that we have today. We have been able to put men on the moon. We've been able to explore the stars. We've been able to cure disease because of that, because we work together. That is a, an advantage that we have. We need to work together today more than ever in a way that doesn't congregate us. We have over 9,000 healthcare workers at University Health System, each and every one of them on the front lines, whether they work at a clinic or at the hospital. They're there for you, whether it's a trauma need, whether it's a medical need, whether it's COVID, but they need you to back them up by not getting sick. We know that there's a lot of uh, uh, discussion in the press that it's your right to not wear a mask, okay? If it's your right, then take responsibility for that right and protect yourself, your family, your friends and neighbors who are healthcare workers, your friends and neighbors who you enjoy spending time. Let's our humanity work for us, not against us. Thank you. I'm Dr. Ian Thompson. I'm the CEO of Krista Santa Rosa Hospital Medical Center, and I'm directing Krista's COVID response. Um, the numbers are staggering. The disease is breathtaking. 1,000 patients today, 2,000 patients in six, six days, 4,000 patients in 12 days. You do the math. They are going to overwhelm us. The die is cast probably for the next 11 days. Those folks are infected. They will be coming in. What you do today will determine what happens two weeks from now, whether you're in the emergency room with no beds in the inn. So what the mayor and the county judge have done, the spectacular effect that occurred earlier this year, we can do it again. A brief anecdote. 30 years ago, I was in Desert Storm in Iraq as a trauma surgeon. When I flew back to San Antonio, as we landed at Kelly Air Force Base, the whole combat support hospital landing back to San Antonio, the city of San Antonio turned out, lining that airstrip, carrying American flags. We have the opportunity to celebrate Independence Day the way San Antonio has done so 
for hundreds of years in support of each other and support of our nation. Let's call this Independence Day a day of independence against this disease. And it cannot be done by legislation. It has to be done at an individual level. If you love your country, you will wear a mask and you will do what the mayor and the judge have told us to do. Okay, you've heard from our uh, Metro Health Director, Dr. Bridger, uh, Judge Wolf, myself, and the CEOs of our major hospitals uh, describing the situation that we are in as a community, and we are in it together no matter what. Uh, so we are going to get out of it together, and that's why we're asking you to pay extra attention, keep your guard up, especially during this July 4th weekend. At this point, we'll go to questions. The governor just said that mask mandates are going to be in counties with 20 or more cases of COVID-19. This is something that, that yourself and the judge and other city leaders and county leaders have been asking for. It's finally here. What are your thoughts on it? It's about time. What does that say all along, though? If you can elaborate a little bit. Account? Sorry. What does that say, though, all along, Mayor and Judge? I mean, this is something you guys have been fighting for nonstop with the endless letters you've been sending to the governor, and now finally. Um, you know, it, it, there is going to be a constant effort to look behind us on the things that we could have done as a state, as a nation. We've got to stay focused on what we need to do going forward. Uh, so we'll count this one as a good step that the governor has taken. Um, Governor, uh, I mean, uh, Judge, you want to add to that? Well, I assume when he said that, he's going to give us the authority to enforce it, and that means a fine of $1,000 if you're not doing it. Um, we've put a great deal of burden on our employers. I know firsthand how it can get out of hand. And now, with the order by the governor, uh, that's going to help take a lot of pressure off of the businesses today where they're not the last line of enforcement. So uh, uh, I know that the mayor and county, we're going to do everything we can to make sure people out there obeying what the uh, governor said. And we saw CNN go inside, uh, this isn't for you, Judge, uh, for Methodist Hospital. Um, we saw CNN go in there. They did a 10-minute piece on um, the situation there, how the hospital is being stretched. Then we also heard about uh, extra corporal membrane oxygenization as a possible uh, emerging treatment to replace ventilators and possibly um, the convalescent transplants, uh, transfusions. Is that something that y'all are looking to expand and help other hospitals um, take part in so that we can fight as well as with the social distancing, but like other measures to kind of help? Um, I'm, I'm not a physician. Dr. Thompson would probably be better uh, positioned to give you real clinical uh, nuances, but I can at least speak in, in general terms about what we call ECMO, extracorporeal membranous oxygenation. It's a last resort. It's not appropriate for everybody. It's extraordinarily complicated. It's a very difficult course of treatment. But in some cases, with people who fit the appropriate profile, it can be life-saving. But uh, there are scores of other things that are much less invasive and much less dangerous uh, that can be done that we know works, proven science behind them. So we have added uh, to our, our ECMO capacity going from, but that's from 10 to 14. You, you just heard me say, we have 343 patients just in our system right now. ECMO is not appropriate for the vast majority of those, but we have it expanded. Uh, we have it available. But as we've as we've treated more and more patients, you know, we've been in this uh, in San Antonio since February 10th was when we admitted our first patient. Uh, we've gotten better at treating uh, those patients in a variety of ways. One of those tools has been ECMO, but it would not be the, the first or the second or the third line of defense. It's usually our last uh, alternative if we're going to treat somebody. Is it possible to bring these numbers down without another stay-at-home order, without shutting down businesses again? Any other doctor is welcome to pitch in. The point behind that is to keep folks away from each other. 
Um, anything that can be done to keep us, some countries use maybe two meters or longer, 10 to 12 feet apart. If you can do that and you can wear your mask, you can achieve the same thing. It's unfortunate that if we continue in this way and you have to implement that, you have all the pain associated with that when it is not necessary at all. Just by simply distancing and wearing a mask, you can achieve close to the same thing. But if you have rates that increase like this, it puts these two gentlemen in, in essentially a, a, a situation where those kinds of decisions may need to be considered. So it's, it's not the shutting down that's, that's necessarily, it's the keeping people at a distance because talking like I'm doing now or being in close proximity, that virus travels out for a fairly long, long distance. And that's the whole point of this. Uh, Dr. Thompson and the other hospital CEOs, do you see us getting to a point where we are going to need the field hospitals that we're seeing set up at Freeman Coliseum um, and, and other cities as well? Do you see us getting to a point where we're going to need that? Well, I'm here. So um, the challenge with some of the field hospitals is their capabilities. Field hospitals tend to be patient, 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 patient. So they tend to be the capability of handling the less acute patients and the ability to change those into ICUs and take the kinds of, do the kinds of things that are happening at Methodist and Baptist and University and Christus. You really don't have that capability. It's not the answer to this, but it may be necessary just simply because of the volume of patients. You saw what happened in New York with the comfort, for example. Um, some of the capabilities may not be there. I'm wondering if some of the other hospitals can share their COVID patient numbers and if anybody is concerned about personnel or the availability of PPE. Why don't, when we do that in a second, Rosanna, but let me, um, these numbers aren't um, scrubbed yet, but these are the numbers for today and I can go ahead and give those to you now because I think it underscores the seriousness of, of where we are. Uh, we are reporting an additional uh, 374 cases today of COVID-19, an additional four deaths. I don't have details for them um, yet because of the, the earliness of these numbers. Um, we're up to 1,074 patients in the hospital, 332 in ICU, 180 on ventilators. We have dipped below 400 ventilators available in this community for the first time. Um, our defense adjusted beds, you know, we talked about that yesterday. These are, these are yield in terms of our capacity available for staffed hospital beds is now 13%. And just another picture of, of what's happening out there. We track on a daily basis the number of EMS calls. Um, when we were doing well as a community and the numbers were going down, we'd average somewhere around 20 calls a day. Yesterday, we recorded 101 calls um, and 61 transports related to COVID-19. And uh, for the Baptist Health System, uh, currently we have about or approximately 350 patients. 90 of those are requiring ICU level care. The rest are in some step down uh, area of that. Um, and we continue to expand our ICU capacity, which I think is uh, something that, that's going to be needed. We're taking areas that haven't been ICUs in many years or repurposing pediatric ICUs to become ICUs. We're also looking at places where we recover uh, people after surgery and turning those into ICU related care areas um, as well. We have approximately 78 patients on ventilation right now. Um, and so, you know, obviously that's a lot of patients in, in different ICUs and such. And, uh, you know, we continue. One thing I will tell you this, and I think it's very important for everybody to know this, the local hospital systems here have worked hand in hand together to make sure that the care that we provide the community is as consistent as possible, our visitation is as consistent as possible, because it's the right guidelines and we're all on board with that. So we do appreciate the, the mayor and the county judge for their support with that as well and our uh, local advisory council. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, on Thursday, uh, we had 25 patients at University Hospital. 
Uh, today we have 144. So you can see the, the increase. Um, it's fourfold. Uh, it's not sustainable. So what are we doing about it? Um, we've closed our rehab unit. We're sending rehab patients through private rehab facilities. We've taken those 27 beds and rehab and turned them into medicine beds. We've taken our uh, preoperative beds, and these are beds that, that people uh, uh, wait for before they have an operation, and the postoperative beds after they get the operation, uh, and turned those into beds. Those are an additional 42. But those are not the kind of beds that you and I would normally consider staying in when, when, if we were hospitalized. You know, we'd go to a regular room with a regular bed in that room. So we're figuring all sorts of ways to add beds, but that's not a long-term solution. I've heard that in some cities, they've turned the ORs that they can't use and put three or four patients in the ORs because the ORs are large enough to do that. We don't want to get there. Again, I think that the message from the judge and from the mayor is clear. We all need to take personal responsibility. Uh, we need to uh, distance from others. We need to help the healthcare workers do their job. Have there been any nurses from out of state come in to help with this? And how many nurses are here? And how long do we anticipate them staying? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we're bringing in nurses from out of state. Uh, the number changes literally uh, every day. Um, in, in, in the case of uh, my system, we brought in 30 nurses from out of state this week, but we'll have in excess of 100 who arrive next week. I'm sure the other systems, the numbers are going to change, but we're, we're doing, pulling all available levers. The other thing I'd say is we provided um, really unprecedented financial incentives to our own nurses, our full-time and our part-time uh, and our per diem staff to, to have them work extra shifts and they have rallied, they have stepped up and, and so we have uh, vastly more than half of our nurses are consistently working overtime shifts. Our healthcare workers have stepped up but we can only ask that from them for so long. And, and, and at some point, um, they have families and they have health needs as well. And we've got to be able to provide some protection for them. And the burden that we're placing on them right now and the growth rates that we're experiencing can't be sustained. So uh, talking about the ICU capacity, uh, you say that we're running out of sort of that capacity. What is the total number of ICU beds or the... Uh, total number of you know beds that ICUs are able to staff at this point you know it's we, uh, I don't think anybody here has the exact number that's not the point sorry the point is that you heard Mr. Hernandez and and I know that all of the hospital CEOs are increasing the number of ICU beds to patients in a room, changing areas, adding all this equipment, bringing in equipment from outside. Um, that's not the approach to this. So we're responding to this. I mean, we've gone in our hospital with 18 to 50 in a three week period of time. All these hospital CEOs went through that effort back in March and because the leadership of San Antonio and the citizens of San Antonio prevented it in March, didn't need it. Now those plans are being brought out, dusted off and responding. And what is breathtaking is the fact that those numbers day to day, they're not decreasing. They're continuing to go up. So that's really, so we will continue to respond, but I think Mr. Harrison's point is well, well, well taken that it is simply unsustainable if it continues at its trajectory. If I could just make one comment on that. I think it's important to also note that um, the, the other diseases, other viruses, other medical conditions didn't take a break during COVID. Okay, so they're still there and our ICUs would generally be 65% to 75% full. And so it is extremely important that we create new ICU space and so even if we have 1,000 ICU beds, you can rest assured that 500 of those would have been used for something else or be in use already. And so it is a tall task, but um, we, we certainly are up to the challenge right now. 
While we have this platform and the hospital leaders here, can we talk about the patient makeup? Paint us a picture of what we're seeing. I know we've seen a shift in this wave, but for the folks out there, what are these patients looking like? How seriously sick are they? You'll probably get different perspectives on this. Um, let me give you a couple of examples I just made from just Baptist Health System. About half of our patients are 60 plus years of age. Okay, the other half are below. Um, we see probably the greatest cohort, cohort of those 50% below 60 are the 40 to, uh, I think it's 40 to 50 or whatever. Um, and then there's a smaller percentage, probably 10 to 15% that are um, under 30 years of age. And we track generally 19 to 30 and such. But it, you're right, it is a different cohort of patients. The first go around, our numbers were much, much lower. I think highest we ever had, all of us combined, uh, was somewhere around 175 patients in-house. And now, like I said, we're close to 1,100 patients in-house. Um, but, you know, that first cohort of patients from the nursing homes, they were, they were very sick. All of them required ICU level of care. The mortality rate was extremely high. Um, but but uh, this cohort, we, we do seem to have better outcomes. It's still a very long length of stay, so remember that. When you get an ICU bed tied up, it's going to be tied up for generally 12 days. Um, most other illnesses will go into the ICU for two to three. So um, it, it certainly puts a stress on the system. This will be the last one. We're going to do, okay, we'll do yours. Well, okay. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing an increase of younger patients having to be admitted to hospitals. Does this indicate that the disease is mutating at all? And, or is it just really the actions of, of the younger generation that are kind of fueling this rise? And then what message do you have for those people in that age range? So you're correct. We are seeing a younger demographic in both cases and hospital admissions. Um, this is not an indication that the virus is mutating. This is an indication that our young people are not following the rules. Um, so my message to them is to uh, keep six feet apart from other people, uh, wear masks, and wash your hands frequently. The same message that we've been using. Unfortunately, I'm probably not the best messenger, so you would be an excellent messenger for that. If so, if you could help us spread the word um, that we need our, our younger um, groups to pay attention to those same rules. Thanks. A uh, question for the mayor. If you were allowed by the state, by the governor, how different would your uh, city order be uh, to address this uh, pandemic? So I'll outline the, in the letter that we issued the other day, uh, we would drop capacity uh, occupancy in retail facilities to 50% or less. Uh, we would also, again, uh, as he did today, make sure that masks were mandated. We would also eliminate all the exceptions related to mass gatherings inside and outside. Uh, that's a few short things, but this is a dynamic situation. We have those conversations with our public health authority every single day. The numbers may change in an hour, and the recommendations from them might change as well. So we're trying to get ahead of this. Um, we've been in front of it uh, up until the point where uh, the reopening uh, began to move faster than the data suggested it should. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.